Joining me now is New York Democratic Congressman Jamal Bowman. Congressman, thank you so much for being here. I, I feel like you may help us understand this moment in, in the way that it needs to be d talked about. My first, just I would love to get your reaction to what has unfolded on airwaves across this country over the course of the last few hours. So this is an expulsion because members of the Tennessee legislature stood up for our children and spoke out against gun violence because guns are the number one killer of children in our country. Nine-year-old children were killed. In Sandy Hook, six-year-old children were killed. Imagine going to the funeral and looking at the size of a nine-year-old casket mm. or a six-year-old casket. Thank God for these Tennessee legislators for speaking up and pushing back against what's happening in Tennessee, but it's also happening around the country. Republicans are sacrificing the lives of our children in protection of the Second Amendment. If we can't protect our children, we don't have a democracy. Mm -hmm. Our democracy is broken, it's rotten, it's sickened, it's cancerous if we allow children to be killed. That's what's happening, and I'm glad to see the pushback. They were expelled, but their expulsion is going to lead to the continued organizing and grassroots movement that's happening in Tennessee and across the country. Young people aren't standing for this. People of my generation aren't standing for this. It's time for a movement to transform America into what it's capable of being. I feel like it's almost generous to suggest that the reason Republicans are doing this is because of the Second Amendment, because I look at it and I think, well, they, maybe on its face, this is about the NRA and about gun rights, but it seems to be about something deeper. And race is absolutely what appears to be part of this, but also just naked partisan gain, yeah. owning the libs, putting them in their place, the parallels that are being drawn between this and January 6th. It's like Republicans have been looking for a way to paper over what is such a heinous, ugly chapter in their party's history, which is to say the January 6th insurrection. They're trying to draw a parallel with what's happening here to make themselves look less less poisonous, less ugly. Yeah. And I, let, let's just first unpack the racial piece of it, because I, it is two lawmakers of color who are ejected from the legislature and a white woman who is who is left in. I, I think the answer may be obvious, but I, how do you read that? Racism, uh, simply put. But another layer of the racial piece to this as long as black and brown people are disproportionately killed by guns in our country, Republicans are OK with things as they are. This is a Republican Party, and this isn't a sick ideology passed down from generation to generation. This is slavery, Jim Crow, the Ku Klux Klan, eugenics, the Second Amendment, the Great Replacement Theory, mm -hmm. right? It's all of that balled into this thing. So. Guns are the number one killer of children. Also, disproportionately, black and brown people are killed by guns in comparison. Domestic violence and gun violence is something that we have to talk about as well. Women being killed by their partners by guns. Republicans historically have been against women's rights and, and women's civil liberties. You know, Roe v. Wade is one. And presently, and present, say, right? yes. Roe v. Wade is one example of that. So this is who they are. Another thing I want to mention is this. They can no longer win on the merits of their arguments. Yeah. They have no ideas. They have no vision for the present or future of our country. So they want to take us back to a time of continued oppression. And now that they're in super majorities and wherever they have power, they are going to be heavy handed with that power. Mm -hmm. So we have to be heavy handed with our resistance to that power. And the First Amendment is about peaceful assembly and speaking out, which is what those legislators did. But it has to, this democracy is hanging by a thread because of the previous president and obviously their party. We have to organize across this country, people who believe in justice and equality to take it back. I mean, I, I watch that and I think there are a lot of people in this country who will feel incensed, impassioned, angry, and motivated. Yes. If the point of all of this was to silence 
the men of color, the women of color, the progressives, the uppity folks who dare raise their hands and hold the megaphones. Well, they got another thing coming to them. I mean, I just it really feels like this is an inflection point. This is a signal moment for people who care not just about gun safety, not just about representative democracy, but about the sort of big future of the American project. Right. Like this is a big deal. And to try and pretend any, it's anything otherwise or that people aren't paying attention to this is a fool is foolish. Completely foolish. But again, they have nothing else to go to. The only thing they can do is try to kick people out of a legislature because they have power. And this is why in 2024, in states across the country and at the federal level, in the Senate and the House, we have to vote these people out of office. Yeah. Any candidate, Republican or Democrat, who doesn't want to do something on gun violence and something big like banning assault weapons, uh, expanded background checks, uh, training, whatever it is, we got to go big on this. They have to be voted out of office. I want to say one more quick thing. I want to see the Memphis Grizzlies refuse to play an NBA game because of what happened today. Do you think that's going to happen? I want it to happen because then you'll see movement. I want to see the University of Tennessee players who are mostly black refuse to play in a college football game. Start hitting Tennessee and Memphis in the pockets. I guarantee you those Republicans will begin to behave differently. I want to play a little bit of sound from uh, Justin Pearson, who is one of the legislators who was kicked out of office. This is uh, from the press conference that just happened. I know we had some audio problems in the last hour and some he's been an incredible speaker yes. throughout this saga. This is what he had to say. Let's take a listen. It's always in the places and with the people who get pushed to the periphery, the people who get told to be quiet, the folks who get expelled. The people who are pushed to the margins mm -hmm. that show the society what it truly means to fight, yeah. what it truly means to get to the center of the conversation, yeah. to get to the issues that are at stake. Yeah. And sometimes that takes breaking a few decorum rules. Yeah. Sometimes to get from the periphery in the back of the house, you got to go to the well of democracy. Yeah. and demand that democracy be true for everybody yeah. and not just the rich white men in suits yeah. not just the rich white people who got these positions of power perpetuating the status quo you know there's a moment in american politics when when the sort of you know impassioned incense rhetoric from this clearly the progressive wing of the party would have seen you know on the left side I, I feel like this is now the mainstream opinion in, in, in the Democratic Party. And I wonder how, you know, have you talked to other folks in the Democratic caucus about what's happening in Tennessee? Is the feeling of anger shared across the spectrum of, of Democrats from centrists to progressives? Absolutely. It is shared. People are enraged at what's happening and what has been happening. When I had my engagement, my argument, if you will, with Representative Massey, People were texting me from the caucus saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for stepping up. My office couldn't stop receiving calls from all over the country because it's not just people in the House. It's people across the country who are like, finally, finally, no more thoughts and prayers. We need action. We need to see that someone is pissed off about this. Yeah. And that's why we got that reaction. And so... You know, I love what he said about decorum there, because I was criticized for my lack of decorum. Decorum, children are being slaughtered by assault rifles. What do you mean decorum? Throughout American history, we have become better because of mass movements throughout our history, because of moments like this that turned into mass movements. We need that right now because we still have tens of millions of people who don't consistently participate in our democracy. And we need everyone watching this, everyone on social media, don't just tweet, you can do that, but you gotta knock doors, you gotta hand out flyers, you gotta go to the church, the supermarket, the schools, you gotta engage your neighbor, introduce yourself, talk about where we want this country to go. Our country, need, we have founding documents, you know, we have the, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, we need a document that paints the picture of a vision for America. Mm -hmm. We need a new document written by all of us, not just white property owning men. It feels like on these two issues that we talk about consistently in the national news, abortion and gun rights, gun safety, whatever you want to call it. 
they are issues that Americans are fired up about, that they are voting on, that they are talking about, and that more, I think, more urgently than anything, that they feel viscerally, because they shudder to think of what a a, a six-year-old's casket looks like, right? They shudder to think about what would happen to their child who was forced to get an illegal abortion or were not or carry uh, a pregnancy to term that this person wasn't ready for. I mean, these are these are issues that, we, that people feel in their souls, right? right? And Republicans, I, I want to say unwittingly, because it almost seems like political suicide, but they have made a calculated path to drive their party towards these two issues in particular and be really on the wrong side of not only history, but where the public is at. Mm-hmm. And I think that the Democratic Party could literally exist on... Only, really, honestly, you could have a party that just focused on abortion and gun rights, and you'd have 60, 70 percent of the country with you. That's right. Do you, do you sense any disagreement inside the Republican Party about where the GOP has landed on these two issues? Do you sense, and moreover, do you sense any movement? Do you think that this is going to wake anybody up in Congress? I think it will. I don't know about in Congress. I think it will wake people <laughs> up around the country. But I think that their heels are dug in on these two issues, you know, fight for the Second Amendment no matter what and, uh, you know, be against abortion. This, they're dug in on those issues. I would add one other issue to, to, to the two you just mentioned, the issue of inequality. Sure. That's another issue uh, because people are struggling with poverty. People can't afford to they live. They feel that viscerally they as They can't well. afford housing. They can't afford to exist or breathe, right? And so that is another issue. They're on the wrong side of all those issues. What I would also say is this. Democrats, we have to look at the Tennessee Three, look at them and be inspired by their leadership. Mm-hmm. And we need to do the same thing in state houses across the country and in Congress because many of my colleagues... I love them, but they're way too polite and they're way too focused on decorum and they're not as loud and they don't push back as hard as we need to push back on this issue and all of the other issues. We have to take back our country and be very loud in how we do that. When the people see us fighting, they'll come out and vote in the elections, the ones who are staying home, because they'll finally see, oh, my God. These people care about me and my child. Yeah, I think that there are some people, um, when you talk about being too polite, who will say getting louder. Oh, what we need in American politics is for is for more, you know, camaraderie. We need everybody to lower the volume. I mean, I would argue that Joe Biden in some ways was mm-hmm. the person who made that case yeah. running for for office in, in 2020. And at the same time, I think it's really dangerous to suggest that the volume is for equal reasons, right? The volume on the right, the insurrection of the Capitol, the the tendency towards uh, revolution has not anything to do with any particular principle. It has to do with power. That's it has right. to do with the loss of power, a loss of uh, relevance, and, and fundamentally a grievance, right? Mm-hmm. That's not what's happening on the left. And I think it's probably really important for Democrats to make the case that the reason the megaphones are held aloft and the reason the volume's getting turned up is because you're talking about caskets and bodies and and survival, right? right. It's not about Donald Trump staying in office. Mm -hmm. It's not about being angry about demographic change. It's about survival. And how I guess as you know, you as a progressive, as you're out there and you see the right try and co-opt a lot of the, the energy, right, uh, from the left, how do you keep making that distinction that what you're doing is not the same as what they're doing? Because we actually are trying to uphold the ideals of the Constitution. That's what we are trying to do. We are also paying attention to what the hell is going on in our districts. A 14-year-old kid was shot at 1030 in the morning in the, ch- in the, morning in the chest and killed in my district in Mount Vernon. A 14-year-old shortly after I got into office OD'd on on opioids and died in another part of my district in Yonkers. A 17-year-old was shot in the head and killed outside of his high school in the Bronx in my district. Another 16-year-old was killed in New Rochelle by a ghost gun by, by someone who was 16 years old. That's the reality of America. It's not just in my district. It's all over the country. And there are many reasons for that. They claim to say, Republicans claim to say it's about the individual. 
Well, they ain't doing nothing to, to help the individuals. Yeah. They claim it's about fatherlessness and poverty. They're not doing nothing to address poverty. They claim it's about mental health. They ain't doing nothing to address mental health either. So they go to all these other reasons why we have gun violence. They're not doing nothing about that, nor are they doing anything about the assault weapons and, and, and other common sense gun control laws. Also, it's not just the NRA. There are big money actors in politics that influence legislation way too much that fund Democrats and Republicans. And that needs to stop. So people refer to me as a progressive. I'm just a regular person trying to fight for the rights of the people in my district, yeah. period. And when you poll these issues, whether it's health care, housing, education, climate, guns, abortion, the majority of the American people are on our side with these issues. And so, again, this is a call to action for everyone who cares about justice and equality and wants to move forward with a politics of love for all people. That's what this is about. I got to say, you know, those children who died were their children, too. Those Republican, they were children. That's right. They were the children of the state that was represented by Republicans and Democrats. And only one party is moving forward to make sure those deaths weren't in vain. Congressman Jamal Bowman, thank you so much for your time and for your work. We appreciate it. 27th, 2019, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas finished out that year's term by ruling that partisan gerrymandering was totally fine. And with that, wrapped up. By the weekend, he was in full vacation mode. He hopped on a private jet and headed off to Indonesia. Judge Thomas and his wife set off on a nine-day island hopping tour on this super yacht, which comes complete with a staff and a private chef. ProPublica did the math and calculated that had Justice Thomas paid for the trip himself, it would have cost him more than $500,000, which is nearly double a Supreme Court justice's annual salary. But lucky for Justice Thomas, he didn't have to foot the bill because this man did. This is billionaire real estate magnate and Republican mega donor Harlan Crow. He owned the jet and the yacht, and he picked up that very hefty tab. And Justice Thomas didn't tell anyone. He never disclosed it. But justices are required to publicly report all gifts worth more than $415, quote, anything of value that isn't fully reimbursed. Back in 2001, Thomas actually did disclose a gift that this Republican billionaire mega donor Mr. Harlan Crow had given him. It was a Bible that used to belong to Frederick Douglass and was valued at $19,000. So clearly Justice Thomas knows he is supposed to disclose this sort of thing, particularly when it comes to gifts from this guy, because this isn't the first time Mr. Crow's generosity towards Thomas has been a scandal. Mr. Crow also gave at least half a million dollars to help Justice Thomas's wife, Ginny Thomas, start a conservative lobbying group, a group that then turned around and paid Ginny Thomas a salary of $120,000 and later evolved into Ginny Thomas's current group, which reportedly works with groups directly involved in controversial cases before the Supreme Court. Harlan Crow also gave more than $100,000 to the Yale Law Clarence Thomas Portrait Fund, which is, I don't know, quite a bit of money for a fund that maybe doesn't really need to exist. But today, ProPublica made all of that look like change, chump change, because it wasn't just that one undisclosed $500,000 vacation that ProPublica uncovered. They report that for more than two decades, two decades, Clarence Thomas has accepted luxury trips virtually every year from Mr. Crow without disclosing them.